All right. Well, hello, everyone. I have to tell you that it's been very intimidating to try to think about this talk. I've given talks. They tend to be in a certain standard format. I was speaking with some of you earlier about I haven't had to give a chatty overview, which is what in a sense I'm talking about in here. So I don't know what's going to happen. Okay. It could take five minutes. I could go on for three hours. We'll just, I'm counting on Francoise to make sure that the latter doesn't happen. Anyway, this is the abstract I put in more than 60 years ago. So this is Nick's birthday, but I'm talking about things that happened pre-Nick, the pre-Nick era, okay? And some things happened that were quite interesting that involved people from the UK and people from the US. And I'm gonna, talk about both of them. I said they can fairly be described as singular. It's a little joke for us numerical analysts, right? But I don't know, as I say here, about the format of this talk. So what I decided to do is basically list some bullet points and then talk about them. So I apologize to you for being victims of this experiment, but that's the only thing I had. Okay, so I don't know if this is gonna converge. Okay, I'm gonna focus on a topic that's not considered part of numerical linear algebra, one-dimensional zero finding, okay? It's got five famous numerical analysts that are gonna play roles in what I say. David Wheeler, not sure who has heard of David Wheeler. Okay, good. A few people have heard of David Wheeler. Jim Wilkinson, we all know, Velvo Kahan, we all know, Cleve Moeller and Richard Brent, okay? So I wanna know where those people were at the time that I'm talking about, which is now you'll see in the early 50s. Okay, so David Wheeler was an undergraduate at Cambridge. He was what they call a wrangler, which means he was one of the top students, right? On the final exam. As he finished his PhD, he was offered a scholarship, a fellowship at Cambridge, but he had already decided to go to the University of Illinois, which is where he went from 51 to 53. So that's 71 years ago, rather than 60. Kahan in 57 was a summer exchange student at the University of Illinois. So he was a PhD student at Waterloo, he went to Illinois as a visitor, as a student, okay? And when he went to Cambridge, I think this part is rather amusing, Cambridge did not recognize his PhD because it was from the colonies, you know, it was from Waterloo. So they said, we're sorry, you can't have this, you have to work with someone as a postdoc. So he worked with JCP Miller, who's actually quite a well-known numerical analyst, and Belleville has said in a number of interviews that he learned a lot of tricks about numerical computing from J.C.P. Miller. Jim Wilkinson, of course, worked full-time at the National Physical Laboratory, but he was on leave of absence at Stanford. He had met Gene, Gene knew everybody, and Gene had invited Jim to come there as a visitor. So he was there in 67. He gave lectures in a numerical analysis course, some of you heard about this when we had the meeting about Wilkinson. Okay, he also visited Stanford in 69. That's when he met Richard Brent, who's one of the five people that I talked about. And he wrote a report, which is affectionately known as CS60. It was number 60 in the sequence of computer science reports. And I'm gonna say more about that later, but that was 67, still pre nit Okay, so what about zero finding? Why am I interested in zero finding? Well, I'm interested in zero finding. I'm sure you all are in a sense. It's been a great interest of mine because of having to teach numerical analysis to undergraduates, many of whom are not particularly mathematical. They're computer science undergraduates. Okay, so that's my, my teaching. And I've taken to heart, a, I should say, a strongly worded uh, opinion by Nick Hyam, Nick uh, 
Trefethen, but he always has strongly worded opinions <laughs> about how numerical analysts do themselves a disservice. They always start off by saying, we're going to talk about numerical analysis. Let us tell you about errors, right? You remember Nick's commentary about don't do that. Don't start by just saying, here's what can go wrong. So I took that very seriously. And so when I teach numerical computing, I start with one dimensional zero fund. You know, you can argue correctly that I totally overlook all these important things about errors, <laughs> but I don't think for those beginning students, that's the main point. So what do we usually do? We, I'm speaking collectively of people who teach numerical computing, typically start with bisection. We have a continuous function, we have an interval, it changes sign, we use bisection, cut the size of the interval down. So you can introduce the concept of a rate of convergence, which is very important. And often you don't talk about errors. Okay, there's a famous or infamous homework problem where you force it to evaluate the function incorrectly and you can show that bisection doesn't work when you don't evaluate the function correctly. So it's easy to see why it works, but then the minute people teach bisection, and I fall in this category, we tend to say, oh, but it's too slow. It's too slow. Don't use bisection. It's too simple, too slow, okay? So we go on from bisection, but we don't make a big point about how it actually is quite useful in some ways. And in particular, we don't talk about very much what you do with any special properties of the function. Generally, there isn't, you can't do much. Okay, but then we're led naturally to the secant method. That's usually the second thing we talk about, bisection. If you're willing to assume the function has derivatives, you can then do Newton. If you're not willing to assume that F prime is known, you just do secant method. You've assumed it's continuously differential. Okay, so it's very natural. How do you do something that takes advantage of the structure of the function? The word natural is totally overused, but I think it's fairly natural to say, let's fit a straight line. Let's fit a straight line. That's what we do with the secant method. So students, and remember, I've always got in mind these computer science students, they can see how it works, they understand it, okay, and they like it, and actually proving superlinear convergence is not that hard. So we did a rate of convergence with bisection, now we're doing the secant method, superlinear convergence, give them a homework set, show them how it works, but this is how it works. And I thought I should at least have one formula in this talk, okay? So wait, here's the formula. So you choose that, that you just solve a little, little linear system, two by two, that's it. So it works really well. People knew about it for decades. I've tried to find out about the history of the secant method, I sort of gave up because people used to call it different names. So it works very well when it's converging superlinearly, but again, as you all know, I'm not telling you anything you don't know. When the function values have the same sign, it can extrapolate. It can lead to terrible results. Again, thinking of the homework problems that these students are gonna love doing, you know, they say, oh, it fails. It really doesn't work very well. So it can fail when the two points don't form what Kahan calls a straddle. Most people don't use that terminology, but I kind of like it. So you need a positive and a negative. Then it'll be in between. If it's two with the same sign, it can get into big trouble. And you can it can fail. So what do you do when you have a method that works really well, when it's behaving well, and can work really badly, when it's not behaving well. Well, you try to figure out how to adapt the method to the situation when things are not going so well, right? So this is where the method called regular falsy or false position comes in. So 
when you say, I want to insist when I'm doing this, that both iterates have opposite signs. So you have a choice. Remember the secant formula has two different iterates in it. You say, I pick the one where this is gonna be of opposite sign. You get the regular falsy method and that's terrible. It's worse than bisection. Again, think of these starry-eyed students. They've learned bisection, you know, they learned how slow it was. And now you say there's this other method that comes from the secant method and it's even slower. And you can give a great example and they can run it and see for themselves. So, so what do you do? Well, this is where David Wheeler comes in. And of course, sadly, I was unable to find anybody that had met David Wheeler <laughs> when he was getting his PhD. I've thought about trying again you know, sending out more email or putting it on an digest or whatever. So he was quite a person. If you just read about what he did, it makes you exhausted. Okay, he put together a math library in the EDSAC 2 thing. So he believed in nitty gritty, get in their work on the micro coat. He designed it all. Remember, he was a math person. And he was doing this, and Wilkes, another famous Cambridge person, in Korea, he worked for Wilkes. Okay, so here's just a statement. He did a root finder, elementary transcendental functions, and a linear equation solver. So this one man, he's a PhD, just got his PhD. He's working on a computer people didn't know how to use. He designed it. Okay, so his code appears. You can find, you'll see, remember in my abstract, I said there's a mystery. So the mystery is what happened to Wheeler's method. So he put the code in this rather famous book by Wilkes, which makes this offhand comment about a, a remedy due to Wheeler is to do this. Okay. And so what you do, and it's, I think, counterintuitive but this is what Wheeler thought of. So in the secant method, you're taking two points and two function values, fitting the straight line. He said, keep the same points, but multiply the function value by two, right? So instead of fitting it to this point and its function value, you fit it to this point and you double the size of the function. Unfortunately, he left no record of why he thought of this. It's just what he did. And Wilkes in his book says, this is what Wheeler did. I can get you a copy of the book if you want. The thing students like about this is, <laughs> this is pandering to the students. I say, you can think of this as a fake function value. You know, it's a fake. It's not the real function value, it's a fake. And you're gonna just, you're not just making it up, you're picking it in a certain way. So do a lot of you know about this? Because it's not, it's, it's, it's not quite the flip of bisection because you're not cutting an interval in half, but you're taking the function value and you multiply by two and so on and so forth. So you don't ever have to take the point that came from two function values of the same sign except in this special circumstance. So it's quite amazing. You use fake function values and you can show that eventually if that multiple gets big enough, you'll get a sign change and you won't lose the interval of uncertainty, which is what happens with the secant method. Okay, so you use fake function values. Here's a picture. I don't know if it's too small, but can you see that this is the original function value. This is twice. Here's the function. So this is a typical picture in Wheeler's method that you're cutting down this function value. You're keeping this point the same. The function value is getting multiplied by a factor. So again, students like this because they sort of get it. It's different and it actually works. 
Okay, so as I say, in Wilkes's book, which was published in 66, he just makes this offhand comment about a remedy due to Wheeler, this, this, and so on and so forth. A device due to Wheeler that substantially overcomes this is to use, he says a half, but it depends on which part of the formula you're looking at. So I wanna say something, which is that Wheeler published almost nothing. This is a well-known thing. A lot of the commentary, he was a fellow of the Royal Society. People said he may have been chosen for the Royal Society with the smallest number of publications ever. I think he had 12 total in his whole career. And he had to be sort of badgered partly by Wilkes to publish a paper. He liked to get work done. He didn't like to publish. Okay, so there's this biographical essay. Yeah. What Wheeler did not enjoy was writing academic papers. His published oeuvre is surprisingly thin. And then this person who wrote the biography says, he was a computer scientist all his working life, but he was a mathematics wrangler. You know, this was, this was really his background carried with him the rest of his life. So his working style, which is certainly a good working style, is to solve a problem and then move on. So I guess he'd come along, people would say, can you do this? Yes, keep going and not stop because he didn't have to get tenure, not stop and publish. Okay, so this was known. Here's part of the thing I'm harping on about the mystery. He was, it was known in the 50s. It was known in the early 60s. He went to Illinois and was a visiting assistant professor at Illinois. Presumably he didn't keep silent about his method, but he didn't publish any papers about it. Okay, now this is interesting. Jim Wilkinson visited Stanford during this period. In 67, he wrote the famous CS60 report, which is called Two Algorithms Based on Successive Linear Interpolation. Never use the word secant method. It's all about linear interpolation. And he gives two algorithms. Wilkinson gives two algorithms. The first one is basically Wheeler's algorithm, but he doesn't give any credit to Wheeler. And apparently Wheeler had been to the NPL and he knew him. So, you know, there's no reason you can think of that he wouldn't mention it. Maybe he just thought everybody knows this. We don't know, we can't ask their question. And the second method, which you'll see in a second, is the one that Richard Brent modified that became his routine. Anyway, Wilkinson also says, Neither is new of these two algorithms. Discussions of their main features do not appear to be readily available in the literature. And that's absolutely right. I mean, I haven't scoured every single thing, but I haven't looked thoroughly. So that's actually, of course, it's correct because Jim said it. So algorithm one, Wilkinson mentions the Wilkes, Wheeler and Gill book, which was a famous book in the theory of computing and hardware. And he talks about superlinear convergence. So he mentions this method, doesn't attribute it to anybody, just says that it has superlinear convergence, okay? Then he goes on to talk about algorithm two, which was proposed by Decker, okay? In a complicated history, I have not been able to unravel because every time you see a site for the Wheeler, for the Decker method, it's a different reference. And I don't know if any of those people are still alive. They're not a crowd that I know. And if any of you know or know of this, it would be interesting to find out. But what Jim says is the essential drive device is that when interpolated or extrapolated by a violation, a simple common sense criterion. What does common sense mean exactly, Jim? What do you mean? <laughs> he doesn't say. 
what it means. So what the idea of algorithm two is, you can do the secant method. You can take two points that have the same sign. And if they give a quote, common sense method, you can take it. See, Wheeler's method would not allow that. If you, get, if you don't get a change of sign, you have to change the function value. It's different, it's different. Okay, so this is algorithm two. He attributes it to Decker. And that's what led Richard Brent, member who met Wilkinson in 69, in just writing the code F0 or 0N as we now call it. You may be interested to know that I found out Richard Brent's email. He's still around. He wrote a very, I wrote and basically said, possibly rudely, why didn't you mention Wheeler's method as, as being from by Wheeler? Why did you, if you knew about it from Wilkinson, why didn't you mention it? And I have his book there, if you'd like to check. He doesn't mention it at all. He just says, here's method one, here's method two. So method one, Wheeler's method just says, this is unacceptable to have these two values with the same sign. We're gonna fix it up. Algorithm two says, is this sensible? Is this a good step? And I have to tell you, there's no clear to me rationale for the criteria that are used. There's just so here's a formula, this is sensible, this is what we test for. And Brent has a couple of parts that I think are choice where he says, you don't use the obvious one of this, you use this other thing to be explained later. So here I am going, okay, okay, where, where is it? Where is later? And I could never find it. So Brent took algorithm two in Wilkinson and added more things to it. So Wilkinson makes this comment of the two, the second appears to be superior in general. And then these are, again, I, I wish Jim were here, we could ask him, there may be situations in which the first would be superior. <laughs> What are those situations? <laughs> what are you talking about? He makes a cryptic comment. It's possible that modification to the basic idea okay, have, might be even more successful. So he talks about using it that way. So we normally, I have to put this slide up. Also as a signal to me, see, I warned you, I might go on and on. Um, all of us, right, if someone says, I don't understand how this algorithm works, we say, look at the code, right? That's what we do. We look at the code. We see how it works, okay? Here's a portion of the code that implemented Wheeler's method. <laughs> I mean, this goes on for pages. This is just a copy of part of it. Now, does anyone know Ed Sack <clears throat> machine code? Anyone here? Anyone that you know? Anyway, you can see it's clearing it, multiplying. Is it, <clears throat> does it have opposite sign and so on? Okay, so Brent did a lot. He added things to this. He used inverse quadratic interpolation, which was not in Decker's algorithm. And he showed that his method would converge superlinearly. Added inverse quadratic interpolation. If you teach about zero in, you know this. Problem I have <clears throat> with teaching zero in for the students is they get totally confused. They don't get it. They get inverse quadratic interpolation, sort of. They don't understand the criteria. What they like is Wheeler's method, which is nice and simple. Does it change sign? Yes, no, bingo, do this. So what about Kahan? Can, can I just, okay. Kahan comes in all along, just not so visibly. So he worked with JCP Miller when he was at Cambridge. There's a zero finding code, which is called JCPM in honor of Miller that Kahan wrote. Okay, you can find this code. It's not quite as bad as the one I showed you before, but it's to modern eyes, it's not clear at all, okay? And then Kahan says it used very few scratch registers. Remember, they had to keep track of how much memory something used, something we don't 
usually think about. And he worked with HP Hewlett Packard for the Sol key. Okay. So Gahan goes on and on. He says, none of us regarded it as a big thing. Kahan had a modification that didn't require a change of sign. He makes a statement. <clears throat> I mentioned earlier that I've been having a little discussion with Kahan by email. I've written now several times and said, okay, so what was your modification? I would like to teach it to the students. Not a word. He hasn't answered me. I'm, I'm going to continue, but I was hoping that I would have a response before this. So more kept coming. There were other papers. There was a whole sequence of papers about this. Okay. And just recently, I'll mention this one thing in 2013, an undergrad at Berkeley took zero in and showed that it could achieve its worst case balance. So in Brent's book, he shows that if you take capital K as the worst case number of bisection steps, it could take O of capital K squared, but he makes a comment, it doesn't happen. So Wilkins found this weird function where you force zero in to evaluate every one of those O of K squared points. It's quite amazing. And when you run it, it takes O of K squared, which was not known at all, okay? Much more to say, but not today. Ask me any questions later if you want to know more about this. Thank you.